Hello, buongiorno. Uh, thank you, everyone. I would like to start this presentation and ask you something. Maybe it's a little bit personal, you don't have to answer it loud, but I have a guess about your answer, and I would like to know if I was right then. So, what was the last thing you did before you sleep? I think you did something like this. Am I right? Guilty? Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Not, not so much hands. And thinking about this morning, what was the first thing you did, you did today in the morning? Again, I think you did something like this. Your alarm clock just beeps, and then you turn off, and you, you know, just see your, your messages or your uh, social media or maybe emails. Maybe it's a habit that you are already aware of. Maybe you have you tried to change it before and you can't. But you have to know that if you can't change, it's, it, it isn't actually totally your fault if you try to change and you can't change this habit. That's because it's what some companies and products actually like, actually want, sorry. We are living what some specialists said in an era of attention economy. In this era, uh, companies just don't uh, compete against direct competitors like a newspaper against an another newspaper or, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, a pen with another uh, pen, but uh, companies are competing against a lot of things, even our attention. So Netflix CEO said in 2017, they are not competing just against video games or TV cables, but they are competing against our sleep. It sounds a little bit crazy, but it's not so crazy when thinking features like this, this autoplay feature. I can bet that you, uh, this feature just stole some time of your sleep, 20 or five, four minutes, 20 or four minutes, uh, some nights. So we can say actually that Netflix is competing against our sleep too. I would like to present to you this experiment. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's called the endless bowl of soup. In this experiment, scientists divide people into groups. One group was eating soup in a regular bowl, and another group was eating soup in a bowl that auto refills. As they were eating, the bowl was putting more soup to people eat. What happened, what scientists noticed, was that people that was eating in this auto refill bowl uh, actually ate more than the, reg the group was eating in the bowl that was in the regular bowl. But what happened is that when, you, when your stomach is full, you just stop eating. But what can we do when we have uh, some apps like this that actually uh, works like uh, auto-refill bowl, just putting more and more and more content? Our brain are different than our stomach. Our stomach just say, okay, I'm full, I can't handle food anymore. But our brain is different. When, when our brain's full, it, our brain don't handle with physical things, right? So when our brain's full, uh, we just get nervous and stressed and all those uh, symptoms a lot of us have someday. I was curious about how long people were using uh, their smartphones. Uh, and a lot of research said that we are using an average of four hours uh, uh, four hours per day, almost half of this time in social media, and we have from 80 to 150 pickups per day. Who believes using less than four hours per day here? Okay, not so many people, and more than four hours a day. A lot more than four hours a day, okay. Uh, I didn't believe I used my, use my smartphone for so long, and I downloaded an app called Moment, and I discovered that, actually, I don't know if you can see perfectly, but I was using, from January to March, it was the last time I saw it, 
I was using my smartphone almost five hours per day. Even if I'm from my computer almost all day long, I'm using my smartphone almost five hours per day. Per day. I have an average of five hours and a half during the week and four hours and 20 minutes during the weekend. So I think it's uh, a large number. And I have about uh, 50 pickups per day. So I'm the average of moment users. And I discovered that as the average, the, the app that I using the most was Instagram, with almost more than two hours uh, a day. And I discovered this feature on Instagram. I don't know if you already saw it. You can set how long you want to stay in, in Instagram, and then the, the app just show this message. It, it, just, it doesn't block your, your interaction, but at least you know how long you are using the, the app. I don't think it's statistically relevant, but I'm not. I'm using 13 minutes less since I I started to use this feature. But I'm away. I'm on my way to use only one hour per day. And what happened is nowadays science, science knows more about our brain. We know how to keep uh, how keep our attention, what pick up our attention, and what persuading our attention. We have, for example, all these red dots notification that science know and you apply in our products that red is a color that um, we are, keeps, keeps our attention. We just, just want to uh, touch it and make this notification go away. We have uh, push notifications for a lot of apps that all the time just block our attention or stole our attention on, on what we're doing. And we have even email notifications. I like this case of Facebook email notification when Facebook could just w show us the photo that we are tagged. You know, we know when we received that email that Facebook said you were tagged in, your in a photo. We are curious. We want to know if we are good in the photo, if we're going to share this photo, or if you have to. Uh, ask our friend to just delete the photo because we are not good. But they know that we are curious, we are going to click in the link, and when we get to Facebook, we are going to see all these red numbers, and you're not just spend three minutes seeing the photo. We are going to spend 20 or 10, 25 minutes uh, taking a look in all these notifications. So all those things is persuading our attention. We, we go to these to this apps, thinking that we're going to use just for five or 10 minutes, but we actually use for 30, 35, 40 minutes, or even an hour or two. It seems like all the, these uh, apps that I showed before just discovered a magic way to keep our attention and be famous and be as successful. But what happened is that a lot of these this products that I showed before use this method called the hook model. Maybe you know this, uh, this model from this book called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. This model is based on four steps. The first step is the trigger that can be external or internal. We have action. Uh, we have a variable reward, and it keeps this name because it's going to be important. We have the investment, and then after the investment, all the cycle uh, starts again. I will explain better in the next, next slide. This is the Hook Canvas. Who created this, this canvas was this guy called Nir Iwo. It's the guy from, for the book, too. He has a slide share, and he created this canvas. If you want to, what, what he said is that if you want to create a habit forming product, you have to answer these four, uh, these four questions. The first one is the trigger. The trigger can be internal or external, as I said, and some products can be addressed to some feelings. And the first question that you have to answer is what internal trigger is the product addressing? You know. Uh, maybe people want to be more creative or being lonely or feeling boring. So, bored, so you can uh, just thinking about a feeling that your product can uh, fulfill, as you can say. 
Then you have to ask the second question, that's the external trigger, that is what external trigger gets to user, your user to the product. So this is all that we said before about notification, red dots, all the external triggers, even ads or, or banners, all the things that are external to the person. So we go to the action, the third question. What is the simplest behavior in anticipation of a, be a reward? So it have, it have to be simple. If you are feeling lonely or bored, you don't want to do a complex thing. So if your product, if you can put something that it's a little action before a reward, so people is more, um, it, maybe this person it's, it's, going, it's going to do this more easily. Then we go to the reward. And remember that I said that's the most important, most important part of this, this model. Uh, the answer that you have to, to have is, is, is the reward fulfilling yet leaves the using wanting more? So as you can see, it's, tr it's tricky because it's what created this habit for me. We are not, you are not all, you are not satisfied with uh, just uh, using the, the app or the product one, 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 only once. You have to keep in use it so you, you're going to have more of this reward. And then we go to the investment, the, the, the fifth question. And it's similar to the action. So what is the bit of work is done to increase the likelihood of the returning? So if the person just get the, in this fifth step, the, the fourth step of the, the hook, then they are going to the trigger again and the cycle is complete. This site just think about the hook model of Facebook as an example. So Facebook have these triggers, like ex external triggers, like all these notifications that we said before. And internal triggers like feeling lonely or feeling bored and then a person just think, what my friends and family are up to? And then we have little actions, like you can just uh, enter Facebook and start commenting, like or sharing things. It's easy, you just have to push one button to share a content, right? And after this little action, you are going to receive some rewards, like getting likes, or comments, or even friends requests, or invited to events. And you like it because you're going to be popular on Facebook, and then we start to develop your profile more, so you're going to have more triggers, and then the cycle just keep going. Uh, remember that I said about the variable reward that it's, it's an important thing in this model. Some people believe, oh, some people believe that the perfect hook model is the slot machine because you have to do just a little action as put a coin and pull a handle and you're going to have a variable reward. You can earn something, you can earn nothing or you can earn a lot of money. You, you don't know what you're going to receive, so it's a variable reward. And then you do it again. What scientists know now is that what making um, this model of, of, uh, addictive is that our brain, before we have the variable reward, uh, just spread dopamine in our brain. And dopamine are the hormone that keep get people addicted to some stuff. I don't know what you think, but I see some similarities on this interaction. You know, you just pull a handle. This interaction is called pull to refresh. So it, it's like you just pull a handle, and then if you are using Twitter, you have more tweets. If you're using your email, you get, just get more emails, and you don't know which email you're going to receive or Facebook, we have a lot of uh, apps based on content that use this, uh, this interaction and it's vicious. We have people that do this, do this a lot of times in an hour. So it's the same structure of addictive stuff like um, slot machines that we are using in our apps. And what is especially concerning is that we are teaching our brain to lose the attention. Another research said that all the time that we let our, all these notifications interrupt us or stole our focus, we are teaching our brain to lose attention by itself. 
I've heard a lot of friends saying that they can't just read a book or an, an article or even watch a film without at some point just lose the, the attention. They, ca they can't read a book or for 20 minutes and probably the, one of the reasons that we are suffering for this stuff nowadays is that because we let ourselves be interrupted with all these notifications and then we are teaching our brain to lose attention by itself too. And people that actually um, help create some of this stuff, like this guy called Rosenstein, uh, he helped to, he was, he was one of the Facebook developers of the like button. And nowadays he is one of the creators of Hazana and he's trying to use social media less because he, he was concerned about how, how long he was using uh, social media. It, it, it doesn't mean that people that uh, develop all these things were bad people or want to create ad additive stuff, but now we are suffering or now we can see that things that we developed maybe not work the way we expected or we just created, we know we, we, we can we can think in the future uh, with all this stuff that we are creating so so fast. And we have even uh, a lot of news like this calling saying that Silicon Valley parents are raising their kids tech free or even enrolling them in schools where uh, cell phones and tablets are not allowed. And people start to be concerned about all this uh, technology usage. So we came with, uh, people are thinking about all this stuff. And there is no a consensus about this. Some people are, are calling this ethical design. Some people are calling this human design. The fact is that there are people uh, thinking about this and thinking uh, and saying that we have to be more aware of what we are developing. Even Google uh, launched last year uh, this program called Digital Wellbeing, where they say great technology should improve life, not distract from it. And they, in the site, they show, they show some products like um, YouTube, where you can, they, they say how long you're going to stay in the YouTube, or they, they mention an inbox, rip inbox but they said that they help enhance focus, uh, ju doing just one thing at a time. So Google are thinking about this, and we have some people and organizations thinking about this too. And I select these four sources, and I just put this together, and I listed a uh, view one, what I'm calling design to respect and protect, using that source that I showed before. So I think uh, about that resources, I think that we have five main points to think about when we are thinking about an ethical or human design. We have to think about rights and data, respect and protect rights and data. We have to respect and protect, protect vulnerabilities. We have to respect and protect control and options. We have to respect and protect time. And we have to respect and protect uh, expectations. So thinking about rights and data, uh, what I think is that we always should have, we always have to be uh, transparent. We have to be clear about the data we are collecting and we have to make sure that users agree with privacy policy. I know that privacy policy sucks, I know that people don't read, but it would be good if we have, you know, a simple way just to tell people what we are doing with their data, you know, just being transparent, actually. And have to be, we you know, have to protect privacy. Uh, we have to, uh, users' data should be only used on a, for the purpose that we, we ask them. We have a lot of Facebook cases that people are using people's data to things that are not nice. So it's important that we just use data for the things that we really ask the firm. And we have to take care of the data that the users and clients gives to us. Uh, we have cases, I don't know here, but in Brazil, uh, every month we have some case of liquid data or 
people just leaking, you know, uh, passwords. And it's, it's disrespectful, don't care about security with uh, your users. Thinking about uh, respect and protect vulnerabilities. We have to protect the focus of our, of your, of our users. It's good if you can align the delivery with urgency. Just don't send notifications all the time or messages that are not important. And it's going to be nice if you can identify the most common pathways uh, in the product and design to be easy to get there. You know, like sh uh, escalators in shopping mall that makes you give all these loops. It's not nice. People just just want to go to, I don't know, eat something and you shopping malls make people just make honor all the shopping. Uh, we don't have to do this in e-commerce or other, ki uh, other kind of products. If you know what you use your user wants, just make sure that he the, the user can go there easily. And it's, it's not common to see about it, but sometimes if we, we design friction, uh, we can avoid mistakes, and it's important to confirm I import actions too. Uh, maybe p sometimes people just develop things that are so easy to subscribe in a newsletter that the, actually the person doesn't even want it. So put a confirmation or giving a little bit of friction, it's good so uh, the user can really confirm what he or she wants to do. The third one is uh, respecting and protecting, giving control and options. As Nielsen said 20 years ago, uh, now we have a lot of ways to give control to the users. Uh, Android have a lot of options for the past years, so we can allow customization and we can error, uh, prevent, prevent errors too uh, just thinking about how the system is developed. And it, intention is uh, another important thing. We don't have to force interactions when users don't want uh, or, or don't need it, like notifications that I said before. Just let people using uh, our app with intention, really, not just pulling the, the smartphone from the, you know, the pocket and using all the time in the line. It's important to, to create products that people are using not just by habit, but with intention, really. So we have the fourth to in design and respect, respect and protect time. And it's important to, to respect time, people's time like habits and schedule. We have a lot of research. I'm, I'm a UX designer. When you're going to develop a product, we just go to the environment of the user and try to understand uh, their habits and their schedule, their day by day. So it's important to, to preserve the, this time, not just interrupt the user all the time. And it's not perfect, but we have the, op the, the example of Instagram informing how long users is interacting, interacting with the product, um, and suggest offline activities or in-person connects to. And the last, we have to design to respect and protect expectations. I think it's the one of the basic. We have the product have to be functional, so solve what product promises, the product have to be accessible, respecting users' abilities. And we have to design to have to use so users can have a good experience. So the product can have negative surprises like bugs or wrong words or uh, words that not, not uh, combine with their day by day. As Uncle Ben says, with great powers come great responsibility. And we know that we have the power nowadays to be in the hands of thousands and in millions of people at the same time. And as this another wise man said, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. 
I would like to finish this presentation leaving you another question, but this one I don't have the answer and I would like, would in, would like to invite you to think about this. Are we giving the option to our users decide what they want to do with their time? Grazie. You can find these slides in this uh, in this link. No, no, you no, no problem. I it's bit.ly slash ethical design. Uh, I don't know the name of, and I don't. <laughs> can can you put it again? Okay. This is the link, bit.ly, ethicaldesign.com. And I have some links that I think it's, it's nice if you are interested in the subject. And I have all the, uh, all the experiments and, and uh, data that I said before. You can find it, these links too. Right. That's it. Thank you.